Well, good afternoon, everybody. I'm really honored to be here. Um, we're going to talk about our story and our journey uh, for the past several years. Uh, we are an internet provider out of Johnson City, Texas. And I was looking around, see some of y'all are from out of state. We live about an hour west of here. So we're an hour west of Austin. And we're also an hour north of San Antonio. So we're right in the heart of central Texas, more or less. Um, our story uh, began, let's see here. Um, well, if I can get the thing to go forward. <laughs> There we go. So our story began several years ago. Um, my background, I spent 25 years in corporate America. I was fortunate to work for two major companies uh, that turned out to be major. When I started with them, they were very small little companies. And uh, I was either the CIO or equivalent to the CIO for both organizations. Uh, one of them was in the banking industry, and the other one was in uh, the media company. And I'm sure most of y'all heard of uh, HGTV. Uh, that was one of the companies I was part of the founding team on and helped building all that. So our journey uh, gave us a lot of opportunities to be influenced by many leaders uh, in various industries, uh, learning how they grow businesses, how they serve customers, uh, things such as that. Um, after 25 or 30 years of running a rat race and running about as fast as I could possibly run and building two major IT departments serving multi-state areas, uh, I decided it's time to retire. <laughs> I wanted to take a break. Uh, so uh, I am actually from the Texas Panhandle area and my wife is from Louisiana. So uh, when I moved her to the Amarillo area, she thought I moved her to Mars. If anybody ever has been up there, that's my home area. But she is like, oh my gosh, there are no trees anywhere. And I'm like, well, yeah, we do have this little mesquite tree right here. But uh, she uh, disagreed with me quite uh, heavily on that. Uh, she's used to those big, tall, tall trees in Louisiana. So uh, after I decided to retire, uh, we wanted to start life over. We wanted to kind of figure out what we wanted to do. And uh, we decided to move to the Texas Hill Country. And we picked Johnson City because I've never lived in a city or a town in my life. I've always been in the country. Uh, actually, in the Panhandle, we ran a big cattle ca uh, cow calf operation. Uh, so farming, ranching is my uh, background. I was been born and raised, but I stumbled into technology, and it was a great career. Um, so moving into Johnson City, I have to admit I was flabbergasted. It is a small rural ranching community, farm, uh, uh, cattle, goats, uh, sheep, that sort of thing, about 1,800 people. But living an hour outside of Austin, outside of the uh, San Antonio area, I thought broadband would be easy. Everybody can get broadband. Why well, was I surprised? <laughs> I show up there, and I decided I'd order internet. And that ended up being a six-month banging my head on a wall journey. And I kept telling myself, there's got to be a better way. This is ridiculous. Is Johnson City an anomaly? So uh, just through conversations, through listening to people, visiting the hill country, I kept hearing this story over and over and over. We can't get broadband. We can't get internet. We can't get quality uh, uh, high speed. And I, was just, I just could not understand that. So we kept doing a lot more research on this. Um, I was actually spent six months with our local telco, who's a big national telco, arguing with them on the phone, and I was pleading to get 1.5 megabit DSL. That was it. There is no other option. Uh, that a matter of fact, actually, it's only been in the past couple of years we got 4G. So when I moved down there, I had 3G on my phone. I'm like, oh my God, I haven't seen 3G since I don't know early 2000s. What does this 3G mean? So there was a it was an experience. Um, I started to when I was reinventing life. Uh, we started to volunteer at the local library. And I thought it was a great setup. I mean, they had, you know, great computers there. They had a lot of them. And I was trying to figure out why, you know, this is great. You know, this little community has this, such a great library. But I kept seeing these hordes of people coming through using the computer lab, using the computer lab after school. Kids were in there from 5, you know, 3.30, 5 o'clock up until 7 o'clock at night. 
mothers and husbands were there at 5 a.m. using the internet. And I was like, man, what a community involvement. This is a wonderful thing going on. Well, more and more dialogue with the local librarian. I asked, what did you do? How did you build such a great library to help our community? And she looked at me puzzled, and it took more conversation. She says, well, we're the only ones that have internet. <laughs> what? <laughs> and she said, yes, we're the only ones that have internet in town besides the school. The school obviously did. Uh, our court, county courthouse, they're paying a fortune for five meg, and I mean a fortune, you'd be shocked if I told you how much they were paying, but these are the things that we deal with in rural America, and I don't know how many of y'all live in rural America, but if you do, you've heard these stories are similar to them. Um, so when I was sitting there with the librarian talking to her, I was just like, how in the world can we develop our community? How are these wineries out in the Texas Hill Country surviving? So we started doing more and more research. And then I believe in Providence, and uh, we were sitting at a re local restaurant, and I finally looked across the table at my wife, and I said, I think I got it. I think I know why God put us here. We can fix this problem. We know how. We've run small businesses. We have technology backgrounds. We're community people. We can fix this problem. That's where we began. That's how HC Wireless started its journey. Let's see here. Um, we started out with some very simple objectives. One is make our community better. We want to help our students. We want to help our teachers. We want to help uh, the uh, um, elderly in our communities. We just wanted to help. We've always been that way. I'm a volunteer fireman. My wife uh, volunteers at libraries, whatever, all the things that we do. We also wanted to provide outstanding customer service. That was the fir first and foremost thing besides starting this company is we have to provide outstanding customer service. I don't want uh, to provide a lousy product and not have good customer service because I don't want you kicking my church pew on Sunday morning. I want your internet to be working. I want you to be able to use the internet. It's a basic utility. So we wanted to provide a, pro a quality product along with this. Again, we talk about Providence. Um, there was a gentleman who worked for me uh, in the banking industry for about 12 years. Wonderful young man, and he and I had a great relationship. Well, lo and behold, about five years before I started this company, he left our organization to start up a wireless internet provider out of the Texas Panhandle. And they've done phenomenal. They have just done it very well. I like their business model. I like their approach. I like what they've done. So we've stayed in contact. Well, when I had this idea after that dinner with my wife, he was the first guy I called and said, tell me what I don't know. Well, if any of y'all been in small businesses, the first year you're just trying to survive. How do I do this? What technology buy? What vendors to do? This, that, and the other. Well, he laid that roadmap. He said, Dave, I know you buy this product, buy this product. I'll save you some time here. And so we did. And it has been a godsend to have that sort of person just giving us the breadcrumbs along the way. We also um, wanted to serve our community, and that's, that's different than making our community better. Uh, we believe in a servant leadership, so we wanted to serve our community. Basically, we give our products to churches. We give our products to nonprofits. We want them to succeed. We want restaurants to succeed, so we continue to serve. How can we help you, the customer? It's not just providing internet. We're talking about serving our community. There's a gentleman uh, in town. I'm, I think he's got the greatest name of all time. His name is Sonny Chance, and I think he's just this great guy. Well, talking about serving our community, besides delivering the Internet, which so many people do, so many corporations do, in small communities, particularly in communities that never had broadband, they don't know what streaming TV is. Y'all all have it. You have Netflix, Hulu, Sling, whatever it may be. These people are like, well, we see it, but we don't know what it is. We don't know how to use it. We've had to go through a major community education process. So I was talking about Sonny Chance. Uh, I can tell you story after story after story. But after we got him turned on, and he's a smart man, just never been exposed to, to the broadband and internet capabilities. 
Well, after the first week, he called me up and says, Dave, my TV doesn't have any sound. Is that your problem? Well, no, <laughs> but I'll come over and help you. <laughs> but that's what we do. There are so many calls we go to that have nothing to do with the Internet, but these people don't understand uh, as they've never been influenced by it. So we have really spent a lot of times just helping our community serve them so that they can use this. This was, you know, it didn't take me long to come up with this mission statement. And that is our mission statement for our company, but it's also our life mission statement. When I sat down with our, my wife and we were starting to do this, I said, you know, we need a mission. We're going to bring on employees. We need, people need to understand why we do what we do. We work hard. Any of y'all ever done farming or ranching? You work hard. Hard is just what your life is. You don't even think about it. Also, have fun. I am a big believer. Laugh, laugh all day. Have a good, good, good attitude. Uh, God gave you this day. You get to wake up every morning and pick your attitude. Might as well have fun. Uh, make money. We all have to make money. We have to put bread on table. We, we all have to do that. Also, uh, provide outstanding customer service and follow the golden rule. I'm not going to treat any of our customers a way that I don't want to be treated. If you need help, if you need coaching, if you need business, all businesses make mistakes. We own up to it. We can, you know, there's no hiding it. We screwed up. We'll fix it. We'll make it better. That's the golden rule. Um, so for some of you that aren't familiar with our area and or if you are familiar, what I have highlighted here is Blanco County in the state of Texas. That's what we serve. Uh, we started out in Johnson City, which is right at the crossroads right here. Uh, but very, very quickly, we started expanding because of the demand. People wanted the Internet. We thought it was Johnson City. Come out, it was Blanco. Come out, it was... Uh, Stonewall, Willow City, I can just keep going down the list. All these communities had the same story as Johnson City. Uh, so that's been our focus at this point in time. Will we get bigger than Blanco County? I don't know. Uh, you know, we'll figure all that out in the future. We started out providing wireless broadband. Very quickly, though, we got into other broadband technologies. Uh, we kept our name HC Wireless because everybody knows us by HC Wireless. But we provide high-speed fi uh, fixed wireless between speeds of 5 to 100 megabits. That's what we call traditional fixed wireless, traditional Internet. That is our greatest footprint. It's, uh, I'm going to say it's easy to deploy, but it's very um, cookie-cutter to deploy that sort of technology that we have. We also uh, started in Q4 releasing our ultra-speed fixed wireless. Part of this was the technology changes. Second of all, uh, the government was starting to release, open up some licensing options. So we were able to take advantage of that, and we do offer speeds from 100 to 500 with that. And then we also do have fiber to the home and business. Um, did you have a question? Yes, ma'am. Uh, very hilly, um, not mountainous, but very hilly. Um, I'd say decent amount of tree coverage, uh, rocky terrain. Uh, I mean, you see some grass, but you go six inches of solid rock down there. So burying cable is just non-existent. You can't bury cable really to speak of. Uh, but yes, ma'am, very, I, I'm trying to think, or whereabouts are you from? Missouri, um, I don't know much about the Missouri area, but a lot of ups and downs, basically. Uh, no clear line of sight. Uh, we don't have to, and that's one reason we also deployed LTE. Uh, we found that LTE was one of the technologies that kind of flows with the terrain to some degree. Now, it can't go off a 90-foot you know, you know, cliff that's straight, but if the terrain rolls, LTE will roll with it. So we started deploying LTE technology because of our terrain and our topography and also to get through trees. We have trees, so. Yes, ma'am, very heavy. We have um, uh, big oak trees, uh, you know, 80 foot tall, 60 foot tall. They're not everywhere, but they're very common. Um, so yes, ma'am, we do have a lot of trees in the Texas Hill Country and what we call big trees. Uh, maybe not Louisiana big, but big, so. And I appreciate the questions. Yes, if I'm talking and y'all have a question along the way, please stop. You know, I know a lot of times we wait to the end to ask questions. You're more than happy to do that. But, you know, please ask along the way. It does, I believe, help the conversation. Um, and then we also, as I was wrapping up, is the fiber to the home and business. We have to have fiber. We have fiber to our building. We've deployed fiber to the main squares in town. We're starting to go down some feeder roads. 
Um, and we did select carrier grade equipment. That was probably one of our key differentiators that we set out to do initially. The big boys run carrier grade. Uh, we wanted to make sure that these products worked. Uh, I mentioned that I don't want you kicking my church pew on Sunday morning. Goes lengths, goes along with this. I want this stuff to just to flat out run. If I have to roll a truck, if I have to go see you because there's a problem, we're not doing our job. I want this just to be flat out operational where it's all hands off and we know that it will run during weather events, during uh, big um, surges, uh, Super Bowl Sunday, those type of things. We want to make sure this stuff just flat out operates. So we did choose carrier grade equipment on the onset of deploying all of our technologies. Let's see, uh, the Texas uh, Hill Country and Wineries. If any of y'all have been in Texas Hill Country, and if you've been there the past decade, you will see a major transformation of what it was 10 years ago to what it is today. Um, and I'm paraphrasing, but you listen to a lot of these old timers, especially people that have kind of been from California that are coming out here, they're saying that Texas Hill Country is like Napa Valley in the 1960s. I don't know where this will go, but I can tell you every year, every month, there are more wineries popping up than we can keep up with. Just in Blanco County and Gillespie, there are 66 today. There are 95 applications in the pipeline at the Texas Alcohol and Beverage today. It's growing by leaps and bounds. Second largest wine producer, 1.7 million tourists, 400 wineries outside of these counties, 100,000 people, fast growing industry. As we were establishing ourselves in Johnson City, uh, some of them are in Johnson City, some of them are outside of Johnson City, some of them have a tasting room in Johnson City, but their winery is outside. They started coming to us and asking me questions about, hey, we need to make our network better. You know, our network isn't performing. All right, we'll go out and take a look at your network. You know, we're thinking, all right, you have you know, some net gear devices, whatever the case may be, and we probably just need to build more of a type of a corporate network. And some of these wineries are, you know, poor man shows. Some of these wineries have 50, 60 computers. It just is a, ver a varied array of, of how big these wineries are. As we started going to them, I looked at the owners and I said, well, I can fix your network, but it's going to be a waste of time and energy and money because your internet pipeline is non-existent. I said, well, what do you all do for the internet? And they took me into a room and showed me a table full of hot spots. They said, we just rotate them through. I'm like, what do you mean you rotate them through? Well, when this one gets slow, we pick up this one. When this one gets slow, we get this one. I'm like, oh my gosh, how do you run a million dollar, multi-million dollar business like this? And they look at me and say, what are our options? I guess they have a point. Uh, so uh, as we were getting established is when we started going out saying, what are the options for these wineries? Well, some of them are on the major roads. And we started looking at that, fiber wasn't an option. There is no fiber out there. So we started looking at other providers that could fulfill the need that we couldn't in these areas. They didn't exist either. These were voided areas. Cell phones kind of worked, uh, but there was no other technology. Satellite, uh, and some of them use satellite, but many of them, most of them just rotated hotspots and they were from every vendor known. Uh, well, when this vendor X gets slow, I just pick up this one, and this is the one we use, and I have this one for these 10 computers and this one for these five computers. And so that's part of how our geographic footprint started to expand. Uh, we, they, they looked at me and said, well, we don't mind spending money to fix the network, but as you said, we need to fix our Internet. Go fix it. <laughs> that's not an easy task. <laughs> and I said, well, for me to be able to get this, I've got to be able to get my Internet service to you. I need tower, I need infrastructure. And they said, oh, I'm sitting here on 100 acres, build a tower, how much land do you need? I'm like, really? And they said, oh yeah, free, here, just build me a tower, give me internet. I was blown away. <laughs> uh, we have more tower, um, I say contracts, rights, than I have money to spend right now. I mean, we just are inundated with people that have land that say, I just want internet. If you need 20 square or 200 square feet or 50, 500 square feet, it's yours. I just need internet. So that's how our geographic uh, footprint started growing with all these companies, all these ranches around the area that are running businesses just donated land to us to build our infrastructure out. Uh, so again, it's been a blessing. 
Uh, we also talked about the underbuilt networks. Well, once we started getting the um, internet pipelines fixed, then we had to go back in there and now actually build out their networks, build out quality Wi-Fi, uh, build out the appropriate routers and what have you. So let's see here. Um, when we started dealing with the wineries, that's what we asked. How can we help y'all? What do y'all need? Um, they needed to provide quality, reliable internet. Their businesses run on it. Uh, they sell wine clubs. Uh, customers are coming and going. Their business or email, everything that a business operates on needed good quality internet. Help our customers, businesses, on site during events. If any of y'all are wine club members and know much about it, quarterly, annually, semi annually, they have these wine club events. We spoke with the owner and said, look, you shouldn't have to worry about the technology on your events. You should worry about your customers. We'll take care of the technology. We will have crews on site. We will have guys and gals on site. We will take care of that for you. If there's a problem, we will fix it ASAP. We also started looking at, okay, we do annual scheduling and look at all the events that are going on with all these wineries. Uh, we built a highly redundant network, but we also take a proactive approach to say, look, during these events or a week before the events, we're not going to make any changes on the network. We don't want uh, Murphy's Law to show up. When we were interviewing, uh, before we got started in the wineries, we were interviewing some other, uh, I hate call them competitors, but people who kind of serve some of these industries that were a WIS. And I asked them, I said, well, when do you do your upgrades? They said, you know, their response was, anytime we want to. And like, well, do you worry about the business? Nope, if we need to upgrade, we upgrade. Well, coming from corporate America and service industry, that's not how we operate. So that was one of the things that we established is we weren't going to take down uh, our network unnecessarily. We also found out, as we have grown, the internet never sleeps, which is why we had to build a more and more redundant network. I'm sitting here shocked at 2 a.m., 4 a.m., 6 a.m., how much internet or traffic we're pushing around the clock now. So we used to be able to do our service at you know, 1 a.m. We'd wake up, go do our service till 4 a.m. We'd shut back down. Not anymore. Uh, we can't do that. So now we're having to add duplicate radios, add duplicate routers, duplicate switches so that we can perform maintenance on one as we fell over to the other one uh, because we found out how many telecommuters exist in our communities. And we, there's a lady, she uh, teaches uh, American to Chinese students remotely. Well, obviously, as everybody knows, China's on a whole different uh, time zone than we are. So she works all through the night, and she has to have internet. Um, so we also looked at, um, when we're dealing with the wineries, how we manage their technology and how we're available for business support. We're small communities. Their business helps us. We help them. So we obviously take an approach to say, how can we help you? Where, where are the gaps that we can fulfill? Whether it's technology, whether it's consulting, whether they're expanding their business into other markets and how we can serve them and how we can link their uh, buildings together on their property or even their uh, remote tasting rooms across other communities. We look at how we can do that. It is something that's a partnership. My wife always says the numbers tell the story. This is us. 2018 to 2019, this past calendar, we only got started, by the way, if you go back, uh, December of 2017. So we're just now crossed our two-year mark. We're pretty proud of these numbers. It's 225% net income growth, 104 in recurring revenue. Our customer base continues to go triple digits. Uh, today, we're at over 500,000 in revenue, and we're projected for 1 million by the end. Guess how many people we have? We're five people. We're a small little group. This thing has been bigger than we ever thought it would be. Uh, we're trying to keep up. We're trying to hire as fast as we can. We're growing our footprint as fast as we can. Today, I have 700 people on my waiting list, if I could get to them. This is, this is huge, Blanco County area, the businesses coming in, the employees coming in, we're trying to figure out how to serve them all. Um, so in transitioning over, uh, we're gonna talk, because I know a lot of this is about the future and kind of what's going on in our world. What we spent time on is our day-to-day -day life, how we live and how we operate and how we've been building our business. Today, uh, the government spends, well, you can see the history over the past decade, 
Um, there's obviously a lot of other various programs, but these are the big ones. These are called uh, Connected America Fund and also now the Rural Development Opportunity Fund. As you can see, there's with the government, with the administration, with the emphasis, there's a ton of money being pumped into broadband uh, getting to America or to the Americans. When you go back to our numbers, um, I want to make a point in there. Our growth has been all organic. We have not had any funding from anybody. In order to get government funding, you have to go through all of these requirements that we do not meet. Number one is you have to have three years of audited financials. We've only been in business two years. How can I have three years of audited? I have to have CFOs on staff, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All we've done is build it with us and our local bank. If it wasn't for our partnership with our bank and our community support, we wouldn't be where we are today. Uh, technologies that exist today for rural broadband is uh, we do have our fixed wireless, which we've talked about. We talked about fiber, satellite high orbiting, and then also the mobile wireless cellular carriers. That's how we get broadband to uh, rural America today. And I want to make sure you all understand, I've skipped over DSL. We don't classify DSL as broadband. Again, when we started out in Johnson City, our broadband for DSL was 1.5. That's about it. Uh, businesses uh, that were able to get six meg, they had three DSL lines coming to their office that they load balanced across to try to get six megs of throughput. So DSL is somewhat available uh, in our communities, but it's not across our community. Johnson City, for example, is three, is three miles by three miles, very small. However, uh, about a third of the population can get DSL. The other third can, or other two thirds can't even get DSL. But we do classify broadband as a much higher uh, bandwidth system. Today, 20% of Americans do not have broadband, particularly in rural areas. We see in the future there'll be a tremendous amount of more government spending. You've seen the numbers there. It will continue to grow. More competition, as there's more and more money, more and more growth opportunities, there will be acquisitions of larger companies, smaller companies, there will be new startups coming along, new technologies will make it more affordable for smaller groups to do it. So it will become more of a competitive landscape as the uh, years go on. The biggest thing that we see uh, that is in demand is higher bandwidth and lower latency. Sure, everybody wants, you know, a gig worth of bandwidth, but what they don't understand is the latency that they want to. People want it instantaneous, instantaneous. They want to click and want us to be there. That's what our latency is. We build our networks with very low latency. Fiber will always have a little bit less than uh, wireless technology, at least for today. Uh, but we sit there and look at the customer and try to figure out what product fits them the best and what product fit, fits their uh, budget. Greater geographic coverage, as we mentioned, not everybody in America has it, and we've got to continue expanding our broadband footprint. And then we have the emerging technologies, most of which are still based off the traditional ones, but they are changing. When we're dealing with emerges, emerges, emerging fixed wireless, one of the great things uh, with regulations, it's kind of a good and bad scenario, with regulations, one of the good things, though, is they are opening up more spectrum availability, and that has been huge for rural broadband. CBRS, which is Citizen Broadband Radio Service, changes the way uh, LTE or 365 frequencies work. They used to be owned by the big conglomerates. They own market space, and we're not talking, you know, little smart places. I mean, big, multi-county setups were owned by the big conglomerates. With CBRS coming out, that becomes a shared license experience. So in other words, we are part of CBS. We were one of the early adopters of it, but so are the big boys. But if they're using frequency X, we're on frequency Y, uh, as an example. It all goes into a big uh, database, and our systems automatically determine which frequencies to be operating on. Made it a lot lower cost, a lot easier for smaller organizations to get into it. TV white space is also something that's fascinating. Uh, it's been around for a while, but now they're starting to push uh, data over it. TV white space, remember the old rabbit ears that you grew up with, stuck it on the roof, everything else? That's licensed frequency, and that has been set aside for uh, television. 
Well, as the satellites come along, cable operators, streaming TV, HD, uh, television, these type of things, that spectrum is somewhat available. And so the government has been opening more and more and more of that for competition so that wireless ISPs can uh, send data over that. And then we have our unlicensed frequencies, which continue to expand uh, with the government regulations changing. The bottom four are really what's starting to, actually all of these are, but the bottom four is opening up a lot of op options for high, high speed and also uh, getting uh, technology through trees and around buildings and stuff like that. Um, merging fiber. So one of the things that's been really an interesting trend is the how do we get fiber deployed? How do we get broadband everywhere? Well, somewhere along the way, people had the idea, well, my gosh, electric companies, they're everywhere. They have poles. They have you know, technology. They have lines. How can we leverage that? Well, if, I don't know if many of y'all know, but in the state of Texas, uh, all the electrical poles that run across people's ranches, cities, highways, everything in between, um, were under an agreement that you could only run electricity on it. So the co-ops, the electric providers, if they wanted to run any of the cable on there, they had to go meet with every single landowner to say, well, that's our pole. We already have this 10-foot easement on your land, but we want to run another cable on there. Landowners say, nope, and that was it. <laughs> and then they could not deploy broadband. Well, it's actually just as past legislation in Q4 that they, they passed the, the bill that now electric company, if they want to run a cable on it, if they want to run a copper, if they want to run fiber, whatever they want to run, they are able to now without having to negotiate with every single landowner. So with that, many of the electric co-ops have been starting to deploy fiber, and that's helped out tremendously to get uh, uh, fiber and high-speed broadband out to some rural areas. Yes, ma'am. And I, I don't know that for sure. I haven't heard that in the state of Texas. Um, I don't know that because right now in, in Texas, what I understand is that electric pole that's there is under right of intimate domain, more or less, and they're not being compensated for the electrical poles. So I don't think they, I, I don't know that for sure. So even if they did, it's still well worth it. <laughs> I mean, to some degree, I'm sure it's pennies on the dollar in revenue return. Um, they, as we were saying, they have the existing infrastructure, they have poles, they have substations. Well, that's how you deploy fibers. Everybody has to go through substations. You've got to get the stuff aerial or through ground uh, if you're in a market that provides that. And, of course, government incentives continue to be uh, pumped out to many corporations uh, and co-ops out there. Uh, <clears throat> emerging satellite. <laughs> And you know, people may look and say, well, you know, like satellite's not great. Well, you're right. Sometimes it has its challenges, but it's better than nothing. Many people in rural communities don't have another option. I mean, it's that or nothing. So it has, it has provided a service. One of the great things with the satellite is it does have superior geographic coverage. I mean, right now there's about four or five uh, large orbiting satellites up there cover most of the United States. Pretty much everybody can get satellite. They are high orbiting, so there is a little bit of a latency, but they are changing their technology at more and more bandwidth out there. The low Earth orbit, and I misspelled orbit on that one, so I apologize. Um, that's really where I think there'll be some uh, major advancements, uh, particularly with these companies you can see that have a lot of deep pockets and able to cover not only the United States, but the globe. I mean, we're talking Africa. You're talking about places that just do not have uh, good internet uh, services, getting low orbiting satellites out there will reduce the latency and have good bandwidth behind them. I did throw in drones down here. Um, that is, that's a fascinating one. Um, no one has a, an exact plan yet, but actually these oil fields, they're starting to do some of this, where they have drones flying around on the oil rigs or in the general area that are rebroadcasting Wi-Fi from a main substation on the oil field that does have some sort of internet. Um, can't keep drones flying forever. They have to come down, but there's this rotation model, and um, it, is, it is changing. I don't know where that'll end up, but I'm interested to see how that, that happens over time. 
we get into uh, merging mobile wireless, and I'm, yeah, everybody's heard of 5G. You either had a conference on it or speak about it earlier. Uh, this is changing. It is changing the marketplace. Cellular companies are getting more and more towers, more and more coverage. We all remember five, seven years ago, you'd drive cross country and you'd lose your cellular you know, reception for you know, 20 miles or whatever the case may be. That's becoming less and less prominent. Still in some rural areas, there's some gaps out there, but with the uh, uh, money being spent by the cellular carriers, getting more and more coverage out there, getting the uh, broadband capabilities out there, uh, their, their infrastructure is expanding and helping rural America. Um, and also, it's been interesting that uh, the fixed wireless technology, many of the cellular carriers are starting to adopt now. You know, it used to be they were just under the mobile technology, but now they're doing fixed wireless just the same as we are. Uh, it's a very similar technology, and uh, they are deploying that more and more in these areas so that they can uh, serve the communities and help them out. So what we look at is the, um, whoops, went wrong way. Yep, <laughs> is the opportunities and challenges. Um, opportunities and challenges that we get faced with every day is our internet delivery capital is, it's a capital intensive game. Building towers, buying the technology, upgrading the technology, going from 4G to 5G, going from 100 meg to 500 meg. It's a very capital intensive game. And for many small operations, that becomes a major barrier, especially to be able to compete with the high speeds and, and be able to deliver quality internet. However, there's also a tremendous market opportunity. Um, it's, 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 we get more and more phone calls today uh, that someone says, well, I want to go buy this piece of land. I want to buy this house, but I want to make sure I can get internet. If I can't get internet, I'm not going to buy the house. It is becoming a basic utility. Uh, thinking about getting water and electricity, pretty much most houses can do that. Now the internet's falling right in line with that. If I can't get good quality internet, uh, I, I'm not going to get the house. Their job's dependent on it. Their life depends on it. Uh, their lifestyle depends on it. They just use it so much. What we see that we are faced with in rural communities is the customer education. There are so many different products out there that are, based, are all doing the same thing. We deliver internet, so does every other carrier. So these national companies all deliver internet. How we deliver it's what's really different. Uh, every company does a little different. And it's kind of hard when you think about it, uh, but if you were buying a Ford car and they sold it one way by how many, you know, quote, how many miles you drove, and you buy a Chevrolet but depending on how fast you drove, it's hard to, hard, it's hard to have an apples apple comparison for a consumer. Uh, they look at a 100 meg service that we're offering and see somebody else where they're offering 100 gigs. Well, it's a 100 gig data cap, not a 100 megabyte throughput. So it's a lot different. It takes a lot of time to educate our uh, user base. Uh, we talked about the throttling, uh, net neutrality, all these things that people hear about. And as we get more competitive in our landscape, they are also going to become, I'd say, they're going to become more educated, but it's also our responsibility to help educate them so that they can get the best product that's available to them for, the, for their money and their budget. So uh, with that, we are getting right at the very end here. Uh, it's really kind of open for discussions. If anybody has anything, I, I always love to talk. My wife says I'm not one who is uh, shy to talk and speak about whatever we need to speak about. So... Yes, sir. You know, when, when you talked about the new yards, you, mm -hmm. you mentioned their need or use for broadband. You said uh, office computers, you said special events, you know, their wine catching and such. Um, I'm just curious, since you're doing it on a daily basis, do you see a use or interest in technology in running the new yards itself? Absolutely. Um, there's, there's several different companies and programs out there. There's the sales side, in other words, just the POS, how they're managing inventory, how they're selling their wine clubs. There are, in, there are a handful of companies that sell those products, and there's a lot of one-offs beyond it, but there's about two or three uh, big companies that do that. Then you have the other side of the vineyard, which is actually the growing side and how they're making their wine and what mixtures are going into which. That is a much smaller market. I only know about one system that does that. 
what I typically see is most of these vineyards have either uh, big white boards with it all just jotted up there, 10% of this, 20% of this, stir it now, whatever, or they're using spreadsheets. Uh, but yes, sir, that has been an underserved area, even though it's established in California, having the local presence in Texas, uh, there has been a gap. And there actually are some of the California companies that are opening up offices in the Hill Country to start serving their products and educating the winery uh, businesses. One thing I failed to mention uh, when we're doing wineries is with every industry, if you think about the oil industry, everybody's very familiar with that, but think how many sub companies exist based off servicing the oil industry. That's starting to emerge in uh, the winery area. There's now mobile bottling lines. I don't even know that existed. Well, most of these wineries can't afford to have their own bottling lines, so they hire an 18-wheeler come out and they mobile it on site and the 18-wheeler goes off to another one. There's so many service industries being built now um, or growing because of the Texas wine industry that's only been primarily focused on California. So. Oh, yes, sir. Yes, uh, you have mentioned, obviously, it's very capital intensive to get started with the towers. And uh, you said you had fiber as well? Absolutely. Yes, so, for example, uh, and I know there's all types of wireless and, I mean, uh, fiber and towers. But, for example, how about, what does it cost to lay down fiber on or about? Or, or <laughs> you just throw an estimate out there? Or? Yes, we... <laughs> It's very, it's very expensive in the, well, it's very expensive everywhere. It's very expensive in the hill country because we can't bury fiber. I mean, to trench something, uh, there's actually a group kind of northwest of us that one that actually interviewed and brought in a fiber company, and they were 80,000 a foot to, to deliver fiber. Now, <laughs> that's an extreme. Uh, the aerial-based ones, um, typically we're in about the $15 to $20 a foot to run aerial but your upkeep goes higher on it because now it's being exposed to elements, you know, even though they're weather rated, but guess what? We just had a wreck in town, an 18-wheeler hit a pole, there went the pole, and there went the internet, you know? Luckily, we have another route, but that, those things happen, so now it costs downtime and people come out. But just to run the fiber, uh, with basic fiber connectivity, not including the infrastructure behind, it's about 15 bucks a square foot. And you have to have the easements in place for the aerial. You have to have the pole access. You got to figure out who owns the poles. Is it you or is it somebody else? So it can get expensive quickly. And, and so, so the buried, the buried, buried fiber, a fiber. That's the one that's almost eighty thousand mm. to the to the highest extreme. Yes. Is yes, that sir. per? You said per mile or per foot or per foot. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. Don't and the think. reason is we're sitting on basically um, they call it dolomite. If you, if you know anything about geology, and I'm not a geologist, this stuff is harder than bedrock. Okay. <laughs> it is just massive. And the yeah. trench, through, and we're, and I mean, we're talking hundreds of miles of this. This isn't like, oh, it's just five miles of it. No, I mean, the whole Texas Hill Country is sure. built on dolomite. And getting across that stuff, and even di during a pole, the trucks it takes, the bits it takes to get that pole in the ground is still an enormous feat compared to, I'm picking like Georgia, you know, where it's just dirt. <laughs> it's really easy to get stuff done. But in our country, it's very complicated. So I'd imagine it'd be like that in the Rockies, you know. I mean, it's just solid rock is what it is. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Sure. State of Texas doesn't have any. <laughs> We don't pay, well, we, I mean, there's property taxes, but not state taxes on it. Does that make sense? So we, there's a property value increase because of an asset being on the property. Like, for example, we do a tower on a person's ranch. Well, now that tower adds some value to the property. We end up paying the property taxes based on that increased value, but there's no state tax on property, if I can say that correctly. There's no state tax. Yes, that's exactly correct. So theoretically, $100,000 uh, worth of land value, we throw a tower on there, and it's now proposed, let's say, 130. So then there's tax on that improvement, and we do carry that cost. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Value, mm -hmm. yes, ma'am. And it's different for every county. Uh, luckily, in the counties in, in Texas, uh, the regulations are very, there aren't really any regulations on towers, I mean, besides the FAA uh, and FCC regulations. 
Uh, but if you're under those, there, there are counties that we provide, there are no regulations on towers. So I can build, build them anywhere and however we want as long as I meet the FCC and FAA guidelines on it. Now you get into a community uh, such as Johnson City, there are uh, some, um, what do you call it, covenants or, or governing uh, ordinances that the city has set forth. For example, in Johnson City, they don't want a tower closer than 300 foot to a school, you know, for whatever, that's what they've stated. So if with the towers in town that we have, there are regulations or ordinances on those. Mm -hmm. So. so who operates the service provision? I mean, does co-op actually operate the service? Define the service. Well, the, I mean, I mean the, 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 the programming, the billing, the, you know? Um, well, it depends on the industry you're dealing with. You're dealing with our company, we do. Yeah. We, okay, so we handle the billing, we yeah. handle the technical support. The technical work, so you're, you're going to do that, but, but all co-ops, smaller ones, do they have the... They can outsource. Uh, yeah. There are uh, providers and systems and companies that can do outsourcing. Um, in many, there's two different, you know, some companies outsource it, some companies insource it. It just depends on your flavor, your market, how you're wanting to handle it, uh, things such as that. But yes, sir, there are big billing systems out there. There are uh, CRM systems out there. Uh, there are tech support, you know, companies and systems. And there's some that specialize to the... Uh, uh, ISP industry uh, that are tailored for that because it is a little different animal. I mean, when you get into uh, reoccurring revenue, that's a little different animal than just QuickBooks uh, typically. So, that is a big debate we've uh, been in for a long time. Um, at this point, no. Uh, we continue to look at that. Um, and right now, our position has been, boy, you look at Netflix, you look at Sling TV, you look at these big, big providers of this, YouTube TV. Not say, how do you compete with it, but how do you compete with that? You know, I mean, they're producing some great content out there. Um, it's fairly inexpensive. It's easy to get, whether you buy the Apple TV or the Roku or Fire Stick, plug it in, 29 bucks, you get this content. Um, right now, we've stayed away from it, and our choice has been we stay away from it because if I think if I wake up from five years, that's how the world is going to be. Uh, the traditional package content delivery, I think, will evolve. Um, you see the, uh, the cable providers, whether it's Cox, Spectrum, et cetera, they're doing a lot of the on-demand now where it's on streaming type services. And when you get into that, um, they do it so well, and we decided since they're doing it so well, there's no need for us to reinvent the wheel or even add that on to our uh, package offerings. There's so many more options we think are better than what we could deliver at a quality rate. We do deliver VoIP, uh, which <laughs> I'll be a little shocked there. Um, when we got started, I, I couldn't tell you how I many people, either businesses or even homes, said, well, I want to go with your internet, but I need a phone. I'm like, go get a cell phone. <laughs> I, I couldn't get it, but long story short, we ended up doing a VoIP uh, uh, tailored product uh, because of the demand to have a telephone line. And right now, I'm probably pumping 30 to 40% of my user base as a VoIP line, and I still don't get it, but it, what it is, what it is. <laughs> I really don't. Uh, I mean, there's so many good, you know, cell companies out there that offer great products. Why well, I go with this VoIP product, but they do, and they're comfortable with it, so it works for them. Or they've stayed with the local telco strictly for dial tone and gone with uh, either IronNet or a different internet provider. They enjoy having that telephone system, so. Sure. Uh, since, all the young people, since all the young people have uh, access to their phone to do things, do you find the schoolyard or the playground less full now because they're all <laughs> taking care of that? Well, it's actually, going back to the library, oh, okay, yeah. the library is always goes, well, you've done such a great job. You know, now, now the library isn't as used as much as it was. So we continue to uh, revive. Uh, they, they're our prototype on a lot of our technologies. We're in there showing things out. One of the neat things our library did was they brought in 
uh, national uh, companies to send some development teams in for teaching Ruby on Rails, teaching C+, teaching gaming architecture to the kids because that's what they're into. That's what they want to know. And so, you know, we help them help the library bring that type of uh, Oh, uh, services into there to replace because now they don't have internet. But you're right. Um, now that 4G has become more readily available in Johnson City, the internet has become more readily available. Um, it has changed the lifestyle. It's changed the way the businesses and community operates tremendously. Uh, we have school teachers. I mean, just you know, heartbreaking letters, but they're just so rewarding to say you know after they got our internet and it's three months down the road. They were just like, you've changed our life. You know, we used to have to wake up, take our kids to the library at 6 a.m. so they could wrap up some homework. We'd be at the library until 9 o'clock at night with both of our children getting their homework done because the school says, here's your laptop, go do your homework. Well, they can't. They can't. There was no way to do it. Uh, now they're able to do it at the house. So, I mean, she, this, this teacher just said, oh, my gosh, you know, we, we didn't realize how important the Internet was to our life, but you've changed it so much we're able to spend much better time with our children, spend more time helping them grow up, and the Internet's just there. They don't have to think about it. It's just always on for them. So there's so many stories like that every time we turn around. I've got a, a couple of questions yes, for sir. you, David. Um, and um, well, I guess the first one is, what are you doing that the incumbents can, can't do or, or, or not do? Why are you able to provide this service to grow the business and the, uh, the incumbent wasn't? I, I still question a little bit of that. Yeah. Um, when, when, I, when I was sitting at this restaurant, I told my wife, I said, I think I know why the Lord put us here. Let's try to figure out how to do this. That was probably what I spent, you know, three months looking at. I was like, why is no one else doing this? What, what are we missing? And that's where I called my friend and said, tell me what I don't know. What, what are we missing here? And the best conclusion I have is, um, is, is, I hate to say as cruel as it is, but I think rural communities have been overlooked. And they said it's not where the money is. Um, it's not where the opportunities are. It's very costly uh, to go into rural communities and the lack of infrastructure that exists there. Um, you know, the, the technologies we have to use to get the internet is a lot harder to come by than downtown Austin. I mean, downtown Austin, you just plug in, you're on. I mean, it's everywhere. Out there, it's not everywhere, so you have to figure out how to get it there. So it kind of, you know, my wife kind of jokes, she goes, well, this kind of goes back to our farming and ranching days. You're problem solvers. You just wake up, you solve a problem. You know, I wanted to go plow the field, I wake up, and the tractor had a flat tire, and the hydraulic hose was leaking. Dad, gum it. Well, there went four hours trying to fix that before I got to plow. But there's no AAA to call. If someone come out and fix your tractor, you have to fix it yourself. And so I think that really was just in our mental mindset, is in our DNA, uh, kind of on that first slide. We can fix this, go do it ourselves. Why wait for somebody else? We saw an opportunity. Uh, we did not expect it to get nearly as big as it's gotten. We were just looking at Johnson City and help our community and make a dollar or two along the way. And now it's gotten to be so much larger than that and continues to grow um, because we just see the continual de need and demand across many of the communities we serve. I just have a quick question. Yes. Are any government grants associated with the work that you're doing currently? No. No. Um, I kind of touched on it just a little bit. We, we don't qualify for any government grants. Um, too small, uh, not big enough, haven't been in business long enough, whatever the case is. We've talked to uh, many of the agencies. We, I mean, it's not to say we'd like to have some of it, but we'd be interested in at least having a conversation. And we, we can't even have a conversation. They just look and say, no, nope, we know we can't serve you. Um, really, it's been community uh, support and uh, moving over to us to help us generate revenue to expand. And we have a wonderful local bank uh, that uh, can is able to lend to us. Many of the national ones uh, were risky. Uh, you know, when you get into wireless, there it's a risky business. But a local bank says, "Man, we see what you're doing, and we support you." And they've been uh, a wonderful partner of ours to help us grow and, and serve the area. I was going to add, I grew up in Eastern Oregon, okay, a real small county, 10,000 people. And there was an article I saw um, at the end of last year that they got a $6 million grant 
to deploy fiber from the use of the Department of Agriculture. Mm -hmm. And so I'm not sure what the circumstance behind that is, but um, certainly it's, it's important for that community. It, it is. It's important to most communities. Um, you know, when you get into community adoption of Internet, I mean, Fredericksburg's done a great job of it. They've privatized uh, kind of the Internet within Fredericksburg. Uh, I don't think they did on uh, grant money, but... Uh, it's a similar thing. Uh, now the Department of Agriculture is uh, letting uh, municipalities to bring in fiber, to bring in the internet. Uh, and many communities have done that very, very well, and that continues to grow. Uh, there's always a dialogue of municipalities running the internet and operating the internet as a utility versus a profit center. Uh, so there continues to be an interesting debate in the, in the world of what makes sense, but at least they're fitting a need. They found a way to bring in the uh, fiber to the community to serve that, and I, I respect them for it. I think everybody does it a little differently. Mm -hmm. Yes? competitor now like PEC or something um, today no uh, will that change uh, I suspect it will there's going to be a more competitive landscape for sure um, we welcome it we, we, we think competition brings a better product for a better price um, so we welcome anything like that that would occur but right now that has not occurred in any of the communities we're serving there are um, as we continue to expand our footprint, we are in other communities that have uh, a different competitive landscape than Johnson City, than a stone wall, than a round mountain type area. Uh, but some of them are highly underserved and some of them have a little bit more of a competitive landscape. But right now, in all the areas we serve, we have not seen any co-ops do any of that yet. So. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. So our footprint is br primarily Blanco County. However, because we just don't stop at the county line, we're really in about four counties because of the surrounding ones kind of around us we touch into a little bit. We do not go deep into those counties at this point in time. Uh, when you get into deep uh, Gillespie County, there's some service providers who are doing a very good job. And, uh, you get into other markets or other ones uh, or other counties are doing some good jobs. We saw Blanco County being underserved and uh, we saw kind of the fringe lines being underserved. So that's kind of what we've kind of gone after. Uh, but we don't know, you know, tomorrow, next year, we may venture into some of these deeper counties if need be. Wow. Uh, I'm trying to remember Blanco County's population. Uh, yeah, I don't have that number off the top of my head. What I do know is, uh, is actually because we were doing some fiber analysis and trying to figure out how to get pricing where we need it to be. And in Blanco County, there are four houses per square mile, four. In Travis County, where you're sitting, more or less, uh, there's 400 houses per square mile. So the cost for you know, a, a company to deliver fiber to a Travis County and have 400 potential clients in one square mile compared to us having four uh, is significantly different. And that's been the struggle for not only for us, but any rural broadband providers. How do you spend hundreds, millions of dollars for four users. I mean, that's really, in essence, what you're doing. Uh, now, will that change in time? Possibly. I mean, you look kind of going west of what uh, Hayes County has turned into compared to what it was 10 years ago. Uh, but So I don't have the exact number. Uh, I can tell you Johnson City has about 1,500 people. Blanco has about 2,000. And those are our two biggest communities. Uh, you get into Stonewall, Round Mountain, we're talking 300. Uh, Home, Home Murray ran the number down. It's uh, 10,497. Okay. <laughs> 10,000 for the whole county. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Well, That's helpful. Well, 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 well. <laughs> while, we're, uh, we're, while, while we're on it, uh, how many customers that you just can't manage to serve because of where they are or because of the economics? Or, or, or there's, there's a fraction of that always. Um, I'll kind of give you a little secret. Um, we're here to serve our community. 
Um, we believe in giving back. Uh, there's couples, I can tell you, heartbreaking stories where a gentleman uh, has to have some monitor for his heart, and I don't know all the issues, couldn't afford internet, and but he says, well, I have to stay in a hospital or a type facility in Austin or in San Antonio, or I can come home if I have this. They pay us in cookies. That's what we do. Um, we believe there are, and some of our community base knows this, um, we, that's where neighbors are helping neighbors. Um, that's where some of our people that they only need a 25 meg plan for their use, but they subscribe to the 100 because they know we're giving back to the community and we're helping. That's one way they can do it. Uh, we've been fortunate. It's been a godsend to have that. Um, so there are underserved, um, and there's still more out there that we need to figure out how to effectively reach. Um, we did work with a major cellular carrier, and it was a fantastic program where we built a privatized VLAN uh, over their network so that someone sitting at that river bottom that has no way of tra getting traditional internet, but they did get a cell signal, uh, but they were limited by the program that cellular carriers had. Uh, we were able to go out and provide these commercial grade hotspots to them, and we just basically resold them. The carrier knew what we were doing. We were open with them. Uh, so that's been uh, one of our solutions of getting to some of these remote areas, these oddball areas that are just too expensive to get to with other technologies. Uh, we're able to provide that service. So when we look back, you know, we started out as a wireless company, but now we've, we're doing so much more than wireless because our job is to deliver the internet. You know, how we do it is uh, agnostic to us. It's kind of that old adage you heard, you know, the, the railroad, we're in the railroad business, not the transportation business. We see the same thing. We're in the internet delivery business. How we get to our customer, we will figure it out, so. So we do privatized VLAN. So um, under uh, traditional cellular agreements, um, you're, you're provided uh, bandwidth, 10 gigabytes, 20 gigabytes, 50, 100, whatever the case may be. Um, with our privatized VLAN that we're able to do with this technology, we're really, we're buying unlimited bandwidth on this privatized VLAN. Uh, the carrier will always have a higher priority traffic during a congestion period, uh, but I'm in rural America. How much congestion do I possibly get out there? So it really doesn't, it's not, it's not applicable to us today, or we see it, you know, for a split second once in a blue moon. So with this privatized VLAN that we've built with this carrier, uh, we're able to run our traffic on there that is unregulated, uh, I guess, more or less, by the cellular traditional services. And the reason I came across that was that for our, my corporate America days, uh, we had ATMs all over the place, and we were trying to convert them off the old dial-up to an internet-based, and uh, one of the carriers that uh, came to us said, hey, we have this solution that would work great for your ATMs out in these you know, rural areas. And uh, it was a wonderful product. So when we started this up, it wasn't six months that we realized, oh my gosh, this would work for that too. So we got a hold of them and uh, worked out a program for that. So it's a little costly, but if, you know, if, if people need it, they need it. So that is cellular based, yes ma'am, as a cellular like 4G technology off a cell carrier. Mm -hmm. Yes ma'am. Yes. On your website real quick, you may have touched on it. You've got different plans, right? mm -hmm. 5 to 100. I mean, yes. how is the distribution of your customer base on those? For you know, well, on? yes, and uh, we, we have a, so a couple of things with that. I got the, 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 to answer your question very succinctly, is our 15 meg is our most popular. And our 25 is our second most popular, but it is a close second. It's just right there. Um, I'd say we have everything from the five all the way up to the hundred, and now we're getting into the multi hundreds. Um, and what we've looked at is the general household, what they're doing, what their needs are, how they're using it. Uh, we provide 
week or monthly statistics back to our users via our system to say, okay, over the past month, here is your daily kind of average rate. So we provide them the feedback. One, so they can, okay, am I paying, you know, am I on a 15, I really need to be on an eight, or vice versa, you know, I'm sitting here at this 90 percentile all the time. What we've set back and looked at, though, and our challenge is uh, we've actually continued to reduce our rates over the past couple of years. We've continued to increase our bandwidth for each packages. Everybody wants the highest package they can afford. It's a budget decision. That $15 plan or 15 meg plan is a budget decision based on that number. And they're, I'd say, willing, but it's a comfortable place to be for their, their usage and how they use it. So, yes, sir. How generalizable do you think your model is? Um, you know, obviously, the, that's the, you're working in an area where there's lots of growth, mm -hmm. excitement, where you got people coming in from all over the country, mm -hmm. really uh, moving in. in. Uh, so there's growth in income and industry. Sure. Do you think uh, there's similar uh, opportunities in other places? Very much so. Um, our story is not uh, a one-off. Um, mentioned the group out of Amarillo. Uh, today, I think they're about seven years into this. They're sitting on 7,000 customers. Um, it's a business model that works. Now, I have to admit, if you're in a part of a country that is just flat out stagnant, there's still an opportunity, uh, but I think there'd be limited growth opportunity. Um, but the technology we're using isn't proprietary. It can be bought. Uh, there are companies that are willing to finance that technology. Um, it takes uh, background to understand how to work with some of the technology and how to build an infrastructure. Um, you know, when we were talking about um, me spending 25 years in, ban in banking in a media company, my forte is network architecture, network engineering, and cybersecurity. That, that's my background besides business. Um, when you look at an internet service provider, you're basically building a very, it's a distributed network model is what it is. How to build it, how to design it. Um, I just think it's a little bit of expertise, a little bit of knowledge, and I do believe it's a very repeatable model in a lot of the markets in, across the country. Um, there are certain, uh, I say competitors, because they're in different states, that I admire, I look at, I see how they're doing things, I wonder how we can tailor our business to make it better based on some things that they're doing, and I probably have a dozen of those from coast to coast that I'll watch and to communicate with on a regular basis. So there's a dozen minimum right there that are doing it and doing it very well. Uh, some are privatized uh, money, some of it's government, some of it's municipalities, but uh, it is a repeatable model. I have no doubt about it. It just takes energy, so. Do you have plans to repeat that, franchise it? <laughs> um, possibly, <laughs> possibly. Um, the, the big thing is it takes it takes the right people. And if the right ingredients exist with the right people, then I think it's, it's definitely doable. Um, and we, we, we have been approached with that by another group. Um, at that time, we felt like they weren't the right people. Uh, but is the model repeatable and franchisable? I, yes, I think it is. You just need the right people. Uh, it's one of the advantages uh, I got to see uh, with the two companies I was with that just grew and grew and grew is one of it was built on the people. I mean, the model is a service industry, which is what we are, uh, but they did it based on the people. The people made the difference. And I have to say, I believe in that. For example, if we branch up to Lano, uh, which is probably a 70 mile commute, I'm not from Lano. I don't live in Lano. I don't go to church in Lano. I don't have kids in Lano. I don't go to the Little, little League in Lano. If I found a Lano person that lived in that community, breathed that community, was embedded in that community, and had the right mentality, yes, it was workable. You can't replant somebody in a community and say, make it work. <laughs> I mean, I guess you can, but that's a pretty, pretty tall order versus someone who's there. Um, we built our business by being there. We built our business by supporting the communities. And we, we say, if we grow, and every time we've grown, that's been the question I've always asked the group is like, can we truly support it? 
Uh, and it's more than just selling the service. It's supporting them and how they live and, in their community. I think that's a wonderful note to end on, David. Uh, thanks so much for uh, spending time well, with us. Thank you. Thank you.